Hello, and welcome to Applied Imagery's Getting Started series. This multi-part series is designed to get users proficient in the tools and capabilities available within the Quick Terrain Modeler software. This chapter focuses primarily on surface model analytical tools. Let's get started by taking a look at some of the lighting tools. I can hold down Control, left click, and move my mouse, and this will change the lighting direction, and I can shade the data from any perspective I'd like. Turn off the height color, and I can show the hill shade a little clearer. I can also click on the Lighting Manager button and light the data based on any date and time. Use your slider bar here to change the time. Note that all times are in GMT, unless you otherwise change it. Now shading is different than shadows. I'm going to click on the Shadows tab, click on Show Virtual Shadows, and now you can see instead of just shading the data, I can actually cast shadows as I hold down Control, left click, and move my mouse again. Again, I'm casting shadows across the data, not just shading. Same thing by going to Lighting tab, use the slider bar to change the time, and shadows are casted. There's also a multi-directional hill shade option here where you can light the data based on multiple sources of light. I'm going to go ahead and click Reset Defaults, and then click OK. I'm going to toggle off my DSM and turn on my Bare Earth Dem. And let's take a look at some slope and contours. I'm going to go to Analysis, Analysis Tools, and I'm going to slide over to Slope Map will automatically calculate and display. And note that just like all the other palettes in QT Modeler, you can load, save, and customize these for later use. And they're accessible here for quick access. We can also adjust the scale of our height ramp. So by dragging the slider bar back and forth, I can adjust the min-max of the color palette that you see here. I'm going to leave Safe Snapshot turned on, click on Transparency Style, and push to vertex colors. What that does is it pushes this to a new data layer underneath our DEM and it's visible here as vertex colors and slope map. I'm going to turn on my global vertex colors and now I can see the results of my slope map. As a reminder you can toggle it on and off by clicking the checkbox in the layer tree and you can export by right clicking and exporting. Let's go ahead and turn the slope map off and let's take a look at contours. I'm going to left click my toggle contours button which to toggles contours on and off. I'm going to right click that same button and that brings me some additional options and settings. I can drag my slider bar back and forth to change the vertical spacing. And note that this data is in meters, so it's coming up as vertical spacing in meters. I'm going to close this window. I'm going to go to File, Options and Settings, Set Display Units, and I'm going to change from Global Default, again this data is already in meters, and I'm going to change it to US Survey Feet. Click OK. Again, right click on my Contours button. Now everything's converted to feet. I can drag this slider bar back and forth and slide it all the way down to one foot contours. If I want to export this, simply click Generate Vectors and a light item will come up in your vector section and you can right click and export. Now let's take a look at change detection volume calculations. I'm going to turn off my contours, turn on my DSM, and turn my DEM back off. I'm going to go ahead and create a change detection map. Go to Analysis, Analysis Tools, and change detection map. I'm going to compare my DSM. I'm going to choose a comparison model. And I'm going to choose another DSM that I have from 2007. Go ahead and click Open. And we have two ways to calculate, either binary or continuous. I'm going to click on Continuous and generate a color ramp from negative 15 feet to positive 15 feet and click Apply. It's telling me that my 2007 data is in a different system than my current data. So I'm going to have QTML or convert it to match and click Go. The results are saved as a snapshot and a QT attribute has been created. I'm going to go ahead and close this window now. And this is the results of our change detection. When you start with your more recent data, then the color coding means blue is new, red is fled. So anything that's red is no longer in the current data and anything that's blue is new. And because I had that save snapshot checked, I can expand my DSM and I can see a vertex color and I can have my change map toggled on and off. And if you recall, I had a create QT attribute checked as well. That means I can now query each individual pixel by holding down shift and left clicking. And I can see a value for my change detection, which represents a 9.42 meter gain for the pixel I just clicked. I'm going to minimize some of my layers here just to clean up the scene. I'm going to add in that 2007 data set. Click on open. Again, it's telling me it's in a different coordinate system. I'm going to click convert. So now I have my original DSM that I had from 2020, as well as my 2007. I'm going to go ahead and draw a selection polygon around this new building. 
go to analysis, volume calculations, a bunch of different ways to calculate volume, but I'm going to compare my latest DSM to my 2007 DSM, and I want to calculate the value of the 2020 over the 2007 data. Go ahead and click calculate. So the volume of this new structure is 1,964,000 cubic feet. Now let's take a look at the travel route analysis tool. I'm going to close this window. And I'm just going to clean up my scene a little bit. I have my imagery turned on now. And I'm just going to generate a travel line using my measurement tool. Click on my measurement button, left click to start, right click to end. We have a bunch of action items. I'm going to start by clicking on the travel route analysis tool. It looks very much like our height profile tool until we look a little closer. You can set your observer height by dragging your slider bar. And by clicking this person here, it'll take you to that perspective. So now I'm on the ground looking at my building. I'm going to hold down control and left click to change my lighting. I'm also going to change my observer height to be a little higher than I am off the ground. You can set your moving speed and your look direction by using your mouse. And just simply click play. And I'm going to be traveling along the line at that moving speed. I'm going to go ahead and click stop. And I'm back into my normal mouse controls after I uncheck my line movement mode. There's a few other tabs here for visibility analysis. There's multiple lines of sight that can be performed here by clicking some markers and observers throughout the scene. I click on the show LOS vectors. And as I move my position along my line, green means I do have line of sight, red means I don't. Please note that these line of sight tools are only available in the US version of the Quick Train Modeler. Another line of sight mode is our show virtual line of sight, which is real-time view shed. So as I drag my slider bar underneath the height profile, my position changes and my view shed will update as I move as well. And now finally, the last tab, I'm gonna turn off my virtual line of sight, is slope analysis. Now that my line of direction is defined using the measurement line, I can break my slope information into cross-track and down-track slope. So I can identify, say, a five foot width and anywhere where I exceed a 10 degree slope limit, drag my slider bar back and forth until I match up with my red on my line, and now I can identify an object that exceeds my 10 degree slope limit. In this case, I'm hitting the steps that lead up to the capital. We're now gonna move on to the cross-section analysis tool. Again, I'm gonna clean up my scene a little bit, turn off my height tool, I'll turn off my imagery, and I'll turn on my DEM and turn off my DSMs. Zoom back out to the full extent. I'm going to click my reset view. I'm just going to digitize a center line of my river here. If I already had a center line here, I can just import from an existing uh, shapefile or KML or DXF. Again, if you make a mistake while you're digitizing, just click the backspace key and it'll delete the previous nodes. So just drawing that center line, right click, and then I'm choosing the cross section generation tool. Now the way this tool is designed is you can uh, create either perpendicular or parallel lines. I'm going to create perpendicular lines. I want the width to be about 500 feet. My spacing I want at every 25 feet along this route. My numbering increment, I usually like to change that to equal my spacing. I'll explain why in just a moment. And then I'm going to click generate lines. This looks pretty good. Uh, maybe instead of doing every 25, maybe I'll do every 100. Go ahead and change those numbers. Update. And now I'm all set with my cross sections. And actually, it looks like I missed a couple out here. So I'm just going to make this a little bit wider to 600. Click generate lines. And now I have my full river corridor covered with my cross sections. I'm going to click on my push CS lines to CS analysis tool. And here's why I changed the numbering convention to match up with the spacing. So now that I know when I click on cross section 400, I'm 400 feet down the start of that line. I can toggle them on and off by holding down the control key and left clicking whichever cross sections I'd like. I can also use the shift key to select multiples as I move around. And I can make some comparisons. You can also double click on your cross sections. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And I can edit the placement of these nodes. So if these two cross sections actually intersected each other, I know some groups would like to enforce collisions and maybe edit these cross sections so that they don't intersect one another. So I'm going to right click to insert a new node. And now I can adjust this node so that they don't intersect. 
Notice in my main profile view, as I move my cross section around, it's actually updating in real time. Once I let go, click off, and now that cross section has been edited. Let's take a look at some Hydro tools. I'm gonna click no, I don't need to save these. Zoom back out, let's turn on my imagery. And let's zoom into some of these parking lots here. Here we can see that it looks like there was some resurfacing here, but I can see a few infalls here. I'm gonna go ahead and click analysis, raindrop tool. I've got some settings that I can customize. This basically defines the puddle sizes and how to deal with getting out of puddles. I'm gonna click on place raindrop. And every time I left click my mouse, you can see a raindrop traces down towards the drain. I have another hotkey, I can hold down the D key. And every time I hold down D and left click, it places a new raindrop. I'm going to turn off my imagery and turn on my height color. And because my height color scaled for the entire data set, it looks like my whole parking lot is this turquoise blue. So I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to click the Z key on my keyboard. And what that does is it re-ramps the color range based on my view extent. So now everything seems to be adding up. My raindrops are going to the local low areas of each parking lot. We have the upper area, which are draining to these three spots, as well as the lower area, which drain to these three. I'm going to turn on my imagery again. And I'm going to adjust my layer opacity, back off my texture imagery a little bit, and now I can see the height color kind of bleeding through the imagery. Now let's take a look at our water level tool. I'm going to close these. Click on our flood analysis button, and we can raise and lower a horizontal plane to represent the flood stage. As I zoom around in this parking lot, I'm just going to increase the water level until that water spills out of the parking lot. Using my fine adjustment button here, and any higher in the water from this parking lot will drain out. I'm going to draw a polygon around my parking lot. I'm going to change the model to be calculated off of the bare earth dem and click calculate. There's about 3,400 cubic feet of water in this parking lot. This could be useful for flood events as well as hazardous material containment. I'm going to go ahead and clean up my scene again. Take away my selection polygon. I'm actually going to turn my opacity back and make the texture image full strength. Click OK. I can turn off some of those raindrops. Zoom back out, turn off my measurement tool, turn on my DSM, turn off my bare earth model. And now we're going to take a look at some line of sight tools. Again, line of sight is only available in the US version. I'm going to hold down M and left click to place a marker. I'm going to right click, analysis, virtual LOS map. I can adjust the observer height and target height here. And I can move the marker by holding down the K key, left clicking, and dragging. I'm going to turn this line of sight off and close. Another line of sight tool is our vector line of sight. I'm going to place additional observers throughout the data and click the L key on my keyboard. And wherever my cursor is, create straight line vectors. Green means you do have line of sight, red means you don't. So I can hold down the L key and move around and it'll update as I move. We have many additional line of sight tools in Quick Train Modeler. If you have any questions or feedback about the content of this chapter or any other topics in the Quick Train Modeler, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you.